Often in video games, we play as a person, a human being. But there's also tons of non-human protagonists that allow for some scenarios that are just a little bit different. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, the 10 best games where you aren't human. Just to set this up a little bit, there's a lot of non-human protagonists out there, so we're gonna narrow it down a little bit. We're talking about non-humans in a human world, like post-apocalyptic, set in a real world or a fantasy world, but it's got humans in it somewhere, either past or present. So no, we're not talking about Sly Cooper, where everyone's an animal, a Ratchet and Clank, where they're, you know, all aliens or Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, actually, I guess there are humans in Sonic the Hedgehog, but tonally, that's not what we're looking at here. So without further ado, here's number 10, Maneater. This is a recent standout. It's a game where you play as a particularly hungry shark with a, a, a one single primary goal, one thing on his mind, so to speak. Eat everything. You start simple, you munch on fish in the bayou, but as you evolve, you get bigger, you start going after larger prey, which includes humans. It's not long before you're just chowing down on dozens of hapless beachgoers and drawing the attention of shark hunters. It's kind of a nasty premise, but the game's surprisingly goofy and has a good sense of humor. Uh, most of it, obviously, going to the framing device that everything in the game is actually footage from some kind of reality show about shark hunters. The humor keeps things light, even if the gameplay can get a little bit repetitive. If you're okay with the repetition, this is a really fun game. And number nine is AVP 2010, developed by Rebellion. This somewhat forgotten, but actually decent aliens game has the unique distinction of letting you play as either a colonial marine, an alien, or a predator, and all three have their own unique campaign to play through. The colonial marine gameplay is pretty much exactly what you'd expect, standard alien blasting FPS, but the predator and alien are pretty unique, actually. Most of the classic predator tools are here. You get the plasma can and the disc, the wrist blades for close combat, and the ability to cloak. So, um, while the Predator is powerful, they can be overwhelmed by a squad of Marines, so their gameplay is more about using ambush tactics to pick off foes and, you know, slowly weed through their numbers rather than straight-up shooting matches. <laughs> The alien has stealthy gameplay though, no ranged attack, relatively vulnerable, but they can climb on walls and squeeze through vents that nobody else can fit through, on top of being a lot faster than anything else. This one's worth playing through just for the single player campaigns, if nothing else, the fact you get to experience the life cycle of a xenomorph is worth the price of admission alone. At number 8 is Deadly Creatures, a game that just doesn't get brought up enough. It's basically Devil May Cry, but with spiders and scorpions. Yeah, it's a bizarre game. It got published by THQ back in 2009 as a Wii exclusive, which, interesting place to do that. But it's a grotesque game locked onto a system that's mostly known for kid stuff, and that's probably why it's forgotten these days, but the gameplay is actually really great. You play as either, yes, a scorpion or the tarantula. You move through these linear levels, take on all kinds of other bugs and creatures, the story's basically nothing to do with the creatures you play as. You're crawling around trying to survive. There's a story about two hicks looking for buried treasure that sort of ties everything together. I wouldn't even bring it up, but the two human characters are played by Dennis Hopper and Billy Bob Thornton. Um, yes, really? I want to loosen my drawers or something. Start here? No, no, I'm just getting my bearings. It's over this way. Who are we digging up anyway? Uh, it is just an incredibly weird game that's actually really fun uh, and worth taking a look at. In the pantheon of action games, it's far from the best out there, but it's pretty fun for what it is, and the concept alone is just cuckoo crazy in a great way. And number seven is the Destroy All Humans series. We didn't say animals, we said non-humans, and what could be any less human than an alien? In these games, you play as Crypto, and if you've ever heard me talk about them, you know how much I love these games. So this little gray alien with a bad attitude is actually not out to destroy all humans. Uh, there's kind of a convoluted plot about collecting alien DNA that's been seeded into humanity in order to sort of restore the alien race, but that doesn't really matter. It's kind of just an excuse to let you go nuts. I, I think that it's better that there is a plot and it kind of feels like they have to progress uh, because the dialogue's all really funny in this game. Take a spin in your saucer. Get a feel for the controls and then go ahead and start shooting! Destroy all buildings! Leave no trace! Bomb those monkeys back to the Stone Age! 
Some of it may be a little cheesy, but generally it's the kind of cheesy that is funny. If you are me, I guess. I'm sure there's people that disagree with me on that. But you get all these different alien weapons, and throughout the game, you more effectively destroy humans. You can ride your flying saucer, lay waste to entire city streets with a death ray. There's a lot of destruction you can get up to. Both the first and second games were developed by Pandemic, and their remakes, which were developed by Black Forest Games, improve on the originals in almost every way. In all seriousness, this is one of those series that just feels like it's a perfect example of why video games games are good. It's ridiculous, it's over the top, it's funny, it lets you effectively indulge a power fantasy that's also totally unrealistic for reasons beyond, like, God of War. Beyond cartoony, super silly, knows exactly what it is. I love Destroy All Humans. At number six is Tokyo Jungle, a, a weird survival game set in a post-apocalyptic Tokyo where humanity is completely gone and animals are fending for themselves. What used to be a city dense in people is now overgrown and filled with wild animals. And when I say filled with, I mean like a lot. There's like 80 different types of animals and you can play as literally all of them. It's got two different modes. There's a scenario-based story mode where you play as different animals trying to survive and uncover the mystery of why humanity is gone because I'm sure that's what they'd be thinking about in this situation, right? Ah, I'm a bison. I really wonder where the people are. But there's a, also a more hardcore survival mode where you pick an animal and try to see how long you can go without dying. The main goal of the game is to find food to survive and then establish a pack. Your player character will eventually grow old and die, but if you have a pack, the game doesn't end because you got more animals. You just move on to the next generation. Uh, the actual story elements are kind of crazy, but the survival gameplay is way ahead of its time in a lot of ways. It's a weird and somewhat awkward game to play, but it's really unique and does deserve a mention. And number five is Untitled Goose Game, which uh, if you've dealt with geese in your life, you know that they can be total jerks, to put it nicely. That's what the game's about, though. Instead of being a dangerous predator in a constant life or dress struggle, you play as a goose, you waddle around, grab stuff with your beak, flap your wings uselessly, and honk. Doesn't sound like a lot, right? It's great mischief. And that's what the game is. It's a mischief game. Every area you enter has its own little checklist of activities, which are built around terrorizing the inhabitants of a sleepy little English town. You steal stuff, throw stuff into the lake, scare children, and you're just generally a big nuisance. The tasks start off pretty simple, but slowly they turn into these little puzzles where you have to figure out how to complete your goal while someone is trying to stop you. It's a creative and clever little game that it does only take a few hours to finish, but like, you're gonna laugh more than a few times, and it never wears out its welcome. It's done after like the perfect length of time. <laughs> Moving on to number four, uh, Carry On. In a nutshell, Carry On is kind of the thing, except you're the monster and you can't really shapeshift into other people. Um, quick spoiler alert, until the very end and you can't really control it. Set in an underground lab, your goal is very simple. You're a pile of flailing meat, you want to escape, you want to expand, and you want to eat everything that stands in your way. Combat in this game is fast and super violent. The monster doesn't take a lot to go down, but as an amorphous blob, you can pretty much squeeze through anything. And the unique controls make it so you can move inhumanly fast to zip around the levels and ambush the scientists and soldiers trying to stop you. It's all pretty creepy, and the controls do take a little getting used to, but there's something so, so satisfying as playing as this unstoppable beast in particular, just rampaging around like a true horror movie monster. At number three is Stray. Of course, Stray was going to show up on this list. It's basically an indie favorite. It has you play as a cat in a post-apocalyptic world. It was inspired by an incredibly packed city from 1980s China, except there's only robots living in it. So the game's a narrative adventure game. You platform around as a cat. You explore environments. You solve puzzles. And it's all very cat-like. Like, that's probably the most allure of the game is just how cat-ish it is. 
They really nail cats. You knock things over, you scratch things, you can take naps. I mean, you really can do a lot of cat stuff. Like, there's normal game stuff, but there's lots of cat stuff. And it's actually really fun to be a cat, as it turns out. Yeah, the interactions are kind of kind of pointless, but they're also sort of uh, the reason that you feel like you're playing as a cat rather than just like a thing that has four legs. All the animations are just fantastic, too. You can move through the environment in a way that feels right like traversal is just a joy in this game the story's simple it's engaging uh it's not too scary there's a little bit of an opening moment that's a little scary but the rest of it not so much if you're an animal lover that doesn't want to see the cat get hurt uh, you're probably gonna be mostly okay with this game it's not like a story about animal suffering it's a little on the short side but it is definitely a lot more than being like a meme game it's really good Moving on to number two, Ancestors of the Humankind Odyssey. In many games that let you play as non-human creatures, there's some element of power fantasy involved, but not this game. Set millions of years before the human race even existed, you play as one of our distant ancestors, and your mission is nothing less than to thrive and evolve in a hostile world that wants you dead. This is a strange and difficult game, even when the most basic actions have to be researched and discovered before you can do them. Even then, the unusual controls can take a lot of getting used to, and finding out how to progress and evolve can be a little frustrating. At least it's a lot of fun, though, climbing around in the trees. Like, the game gets the climbing part so right. It's just really, like, a weird, fascinating game. <laughs> Not a lot of other games let you eat bugs off of a monkey's back. Uh, it's not really a thing that you do. Even in, like, Donkey Kong Country games. You'd think that'd be a thing that they'd capitalize on for humor, rareware and all. But no. Ancestors the Humankind Odyssey is one of the most unique survival games out there. And while it did get a lot of negative reviews at first, more recently people have come around and really appreciate what this game was trying to do. And finally, at number one, Okami, Capcom's answer to Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Okami originally came out back in 2006 for PlayStation 2. It was developed by Clover Studios, and they would eventually become Platinum Games. Now, what makes this game unique, uh, it's actually a lot of stuff. You play as Amaterasu, literally the Shinto goddess of the sun, in the form of a white wolf. Uh, because you're a god, you have the power of the celestial brush, which can do all sorts of godly things. When the game starts, the world is in disarray, your task is to fix stuff, and while the premise sounds deadly serious, there's actually a lot of humor in it. Uh, a lot of that coming from Amy herself, yes, I'm saying Amy, because the full name is a hell of a mouthful, but Amy often acts as a stereotypical dog who is easily distracted, confused, and carefree, and I think that that can easily become an overlooked part of this game, looking back at it, but it really adds a layer into the game. When you talk about games as art, this game gets brought up a lot because it has a super distinct watercolor style, and while everything is very stylized and cartoonish, like I said, the animations on Amy, surprisingly accurate and lifelike to a real animal. Okami's kind of this one-of-a-kind classic, uh, and while it still has its flaws, it's so unique and interesting that they're pretty easy to overlook. And that's all for today. Leave us a comment, let us know what you think if you like this video click like if you're not subscribed that's a great time to do so we upload brand new videos every day of the week best way to see them first is of course a subscription so click subscribe don't forget to enable notifications and as always we thank you very much for watching this video i'm falcon you can follow me on twitter at falcon the hero we'll see you next time right here on game ranks